We want to thank our sponsors, Creative Artist Video Production, for all of your video needs. Snellville Heating and Air, serving Monroe and Walton County since 1988. For all of your heating and cooling needs. And Creative Signs. No sign is too large or too small for Creative Signs. Hello, my name is Anita Peters with Peters Realty Professionals in Loganville, Georgia, and I have some beautiful homes to share with you today. Information deemed reliable but not guaranteed. Some of the featured homes are HUD properties, and any registered HUD agent can show and sell you a HUD home. Thanks so much for watching. On Stage presents A Bad Year for Tomatoes, February the 14th, 15th, 21st, and 22nd at 8 p.m. And then they have two other showings, February the 28th and March the 1st at 8 p.m. You can find tickets on sale at Carmichael's here in Monroe. this year with our winter show. We had the honor of hosting Inspire Georgia last month, which I hope a lot of you were able to see. But that was an honor for us to be one of the nine host cities having that show. There were about 20, show, 20 places that competed for hosting, and we were one of nine. So um, that's why the winter show is one month shorter. But I also took the chance of not competing with the opening ceremonies of the Olympics and moving it from Friday to a Saturday. So I was hoping that would work out. But then also over the last couple of shows I've seen how our audience, where they're coming from and how the artists are participating. And we have so many more that are coming from outside the county that I was hoping that Mother Nature got my note about good weather. And then also hoping that an afternoon reception would work out better than an evening one. So, but of course looking at the crowd here, everything's worked out wonderfully. So thank you all. <laughs> but um, at this time I'll go and do my thank yous. And, of course, I'm looking down at the podium, which, yes, it's a music stand, but I'm also in charge of the music guild, so I'm trying to borrow a few of their equipment pieces. But um, I do have my notes on my cell phone this time, as opposed to the big paper I usually do. All right, so I would like to first of all thank all, all of our sponsors, which those are the First Ladies of Walton, um, ACE Social Circles Home Center, and then also the... Um, oh, wait, I just... That's right, and then our purchase award, that's right. And then also our purchase award sponsor is Dr. Stone Cipher, who's been our purchase award sponsor for the last two winter shows. And a little bit of note on that, we've been going back and forth with the awards and trying to schedule a date. So those awards will not be announced today, they will come in the upcoming week. So that's the only um, negative part so far. But I would also like to thank um, JL Designs for the flowers that they provided for our reception. And then all the wonderful food that has been provided by not only board members, but active, board mem active members of the organization. And that has really helped out because this show and last year's winter show, we had a huge reduction in our sponsorship. And so pretty much we're dealing with about an eighth of what we normally deal with sponsorship-wise. And so if there's been some changes and you notice them, that's kind of the reason why. So um, I've had to deal with a few people that said I didn't get your application form in the mail, and that was one of the changes with, that we did do. So be sure to look at our website for a lot more of our information, and you can download our forms there for upcoming shows. Also, our judge for this show is uh, Mr. Island from the Georgia Museum of Art, and he's the director there, and he's also going to help present our uh, medals to the winners today. 
And of course, this is the part of the show I always love doing. <clears throat> Not an accounting, but I just love the numbers. In this show, we have 135 pieces, and that represents 50 artists that have had work in the show. From those artists, 30, around 30% 30 of them are brand new showing work in the show, which I think just speaks volumes of how much we're reaching out to the community. And then out of the artists, about 47% of them are from Walton County. The other 53% are from outside the county and also outside the state. We have about 10% that are from outside the state. But I think it's just awesome to think of. Our largest category has been the non-oils at 33 pieces. And then the next two highest categories were the oils and photography, each at 28 pieces. So that is just awesome to know that we're having wonderful amounts of pieces in various categories and pretty even with that. We also did have seven students participate in the show. And of course, these two panels here, front and back, showcase the student work. And at this time, I want to encourage, and of course, the Mooner Art Guild wants to encourage the next generation of artists coming forward. And so if each of those um, students that have work in the show come forward when I mention their name, and then just um, stand here in, in this um, semicircular so you can um, be on the television. But um, also, I have um, a $5 gift card for each of the children from Michael's. <clears throat> and the first one is Abby Clegg, and then also Ashley Clegg, Kennedy Garcia, um, Jolie Lanier, Paul Pelham, Thomas Pelham, um, Thomas Glenn Pelham III, and then also um, Joshua Phillips. Phillips, and then also Kennedy Garcia. And you both can please give us yours, Josh. Seal Ball by Joshua Phillips. And then also, also he's here, and there's also Alfred Hitchcock, also by Joshua Phillips. <laughs> mentions, and these also are in, in no particular order. 
The first one is His Grandmother's House by Brent Betts. by John Swan. Not sure if I saw him earlier or not. Okay. And then number three is No Arsenic by Myrna Trapp. Cocopelli Life Dance by Bar Valley. <laughs> One of our newer members. <laughs> Actually, what's interesting is we've had several uh, new members also <coughs> been in the show. And so far, Brent and John were both new members as well. So it's just awesome to have new participating members receive awards. The next one is Cigar Store by Pat Tedesco. And then Here Comes the Sun by Mary Beth Schmelzer. Gertrude and Maude by Brendan McDaniel. <laughs> Gertrude and Maude. Honorable mention. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Brenda, if you wouldn't mind getting your medal. Yeah, medal. Oh, <laughs> 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 so excited. That's <laughs> 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 And of course, before you take all of your medals home, I do have push pins which need to go next to your work. That way, everyone can see what awards you have won. I forgot to mention that one year. <clears throat> all right, and then the next one is "Scalling on the Chattahoochee" by Stephanie Ruby. <laughs> "Dark Palladium" by Margaret Agner. And number 10, Sparta Mill by Roger and Charlene Simba. Simba. I know they said they would not be here. So. All right, then the next category would be photography. And then as runner up, that's also Barn Tree by Roger and Charlene Simba. And then first place is Parking Lot Landscape by Morgan Lytle. And then in mixed media, there is Runner Up, Master of the House by Susan Pelham. And in first place is No Entry by John Weber. In Functional Pottery, runner-up is Leaf's Vase by Anna Marino. place in Functional Pottery is Flying Jewel by Myrna Trapp. In the Sculpture category, runner-up is Richard Sells with The Kiss. And then 
first place in sculpture is Kennedy by Brenda McDaniel. <laughs> On oils. Runner up is Cowboy Up by Mia Rodriguez. <laughs> Mia is also one of our newer members to have work shown. And in first place is Stray Dogs Run This Town by Jody Duke. <laughs> She'll be excited to hear about that. Um, and then runner up in the oil category is Earth and Vessel by Jackie Slider. I know I saw her. Yeah. She's back here. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. We'll be patient. Can't see. <laughs> And of course, that leads into a wonderful aspect of Are We There Yet? We've finished you know, the final one. And yes, we are. All right. And then, of course, the best of the show is Patrick by Mark Flower. to have our judge actually be here and, and helping with the awards um, this evening or actually this afternoon. It was so used to the evening reception, but I'm um, so glad to have him here today. And so at this time, if, um, Ms. Sean would like to please say a few words about some of the pieces. I'm uh, pleased to be here. I always like coming to Monroe. Uh, I, uh, I'm not sure that I am. Uh, worthy to be your judge, uh, because this was a very good show. It reminds me of something that um, I may have uh, said before, but my uh, assistant one day said we were having a Christmas party, and she said, you need to go out and get something um, for us to eat, because we're all vegetarians at the museum, or a lot of us are, and we were having guests, and there was no, no meat there. So she said, go get something. I said, well, I don't eat meat, so what am I supposed to do? She said, just go to Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> so I did, and I go in, and there's a rather corpulent woman there. Oh. And uh, she said, can I help you? And I said, yes, I want 60 pieces of original recipe, Kentucky Fried Chicken, a gallon of mashed potatoes, and a gallon of coleslaw. And she looked at me, she looked me up and down, and she said, is that for here to go? <laughs> And I said, do you think I could eat 60 pieces of original re recipe Kentucky Fried Chicken? And she said, I could. <laughs> this was a good show. And I had a great deal of difficulty in being a judge, because ultimately being a judge for a show such as this amounts to taste at some point. Um, and thus it becomes an opinion based on experience, on education, on everything that I have studied for some 60 years. For example, I'll give you examples, and you will see some of my taste in the award winners. winners. I am partial to black and white, such as that photograph right there, mm -hmm. to abstracted spaces, and to good draftsmanship. A lot of people at my museum are not, and a lot of our visitors are not attracted to abstract art. But once we explain what abstracted spaces are, they seem to understand better. But it reminds me of something that the cartoonist Al Cap said about abstract art. He said, it is a product of the untalented, sold by the unprincipled, 
to the utterly bewildered. So often that is, we find that that is true. One thing that I told Brian that I would mention is there is another standard that I am adamant about uh, in judging any art show. Um, and I've done them all over the country. I do one a year and I do them all over the country. And that is presentation. And if the presentation of any work of art is not up to the standard of the work of art, I really don't look at it uh, twice. Uh, it's, uh, uh, we have applicants who send in applications for jobs. If they have typos on them, I don't look at them. Uh, so I'm pretty, uh, pretty harsh about that, but I am not unlike other judges whom I know who would be just as uh, concerned with the presentation of the work of art. Um, I thought I would talk for a minute about some of these prize winners to give you an idea of what I had done. That pastel that I gave uh, the best in show of Patrick, he's a ruddy-cheeked young boy or man with something of a forlorn expression. And what I love so much about that work is it is wonderfully modeled. And it is a model. It is a model, the, the, uh, the model of the head, the molding of the head was with vividly colored pastels. And pastels are a difficult medium. Uh, but the artist actually created volumetric presence for the head through that color and through the modeling with the color. And when you see it, it's back there, uh, you should note the subtle, rather exquisitely handled asymmetry of the face. Uh, the next is that earthen, earthen vessel, uh, the painting. It's a rather traditional still life of a vase or a pot. It is a handsome investigation of foliage, of fruit, and a vessel on the table, and they all are emerging from that dark background, the dark surround. What is luminous about that work is that table mat, or white napkin, or cloth. Um, and I was intrigued, really intrigued, by the spacing of this work, which sort of didn't conform to that 17th and 18th century Dutch tradition. So see if you are, as well, intrigued and notice the spacing and how it's bound together by the uh, foliage. So that's sort of a subconscious thing that I'm pretty sure that the artist was not consciously uh, attempting. <coughs> um, and then are we there yet? I love that word. Um, it's a vintage car and trailer. Uh, it's an autumn day. Um, the landscape is pellucid, as we say. It's a lovely day for a drive. Um, the work has this nice horizontal format that emphasizes the trailer being pulled by the, um, by the station wagon. Um, it's, as it's presented, and what pleased me so much about it, it's presented as if the highway were a stage on which that car and it's what it's towing was sort of the principal players and the backdrop of the fall leaves and not so distant hills. Um, I like this work a lot. I like it for its mixture of smartness and a certain naivete of subject and presentation. A very sophisticated work I found in the show was Stray Dogs Run This Town. Uh, even the title, and certainly there's a visual pun there, uh, the double entendre of run, nicely conveyed through the byways and the boulevards and the streets and the traffic circles, etc., where the dogs run. It's sort of like dog land, uh, but it's a dog land with sort of a spatial geometry that illuminates how canines and humans ex exist in urban spaces. Um, I told you I love black and white, and this stark sort of painting, the, the starkness of the works, uh, well in this painting, and there has to be another one. I didn't know who the artists were when I was judging, but there's another work which is similar, and I know it was by the same artist, and I like them both. Um, and I liked them a lot. And I thought the artist was particularly effective in presenting his or her unique style. And I use that word advisedly. You know, unique is a word that we toss around. We even say real unique or very unique. Or something's <laughs> unique or it's not. Um, in this case, I did find the style unique and something that I had not seen before. So I was very pleased in seeing it. I love the word cowboy up. And I did because of um, a very, of it reminded me, and I don't know if the artist even knows about it, but it is, um, if you've been to the Denver airport, and you've seen the work by Jimenez that is there in front of the airport, uh, it's a horse rearing, uh, as does this one in that painting, which is right there. 
um, has blue eyes and it's become known as the demon horse uh, in, Denver, in Denver because when that sculpture was made, it toppled over and killed the artist. Um, wow. And, but this, did you know, but did you know that work? Uh, but this is, a, this is a wonderful example of, of what I like so much about your painting is, um, and this is in the best sense of the word, so don't get me wrong, it is illustrative, it's a, like an illustration, but almost like a cartoonish illustration that becomes even a little bit decorative, but with a strange subject matter. It's extremely effective, I thought, in presenting motion, even frenzy, uh, the background brush strokes, they swirl around the horse and the rider, and as well as, and I want all of you to look at it, the hat is flying off in space, and that the brush strokes sort of mimic that movement. This is an artist, and I'm speaking for you, sorry, uh, but um, I do that often. Um, and that is that artist, this is an artist who knows that circles and arcs denote movement, whereas a line stops the eye. And in this case, we have a great many swirls and arcs and circles and movement. Another is Canadi, I think that's how it's pronounced, which is the sculpture. This is just a well-modeled bust. And it conveys a certain sort of puerile smugness uh, that I really like with the must hair. Um, whoever the sculptor is of this is a talented and understands shape and how to achieve it in 3D. Um, Lamar Dodd, I was talking to Lamar Dodd one time when a student was there, and he responded to a young student who was asking what he should do about learning how to model. And Lamar Dodd said, well, have you ever touched a woman? And this kid was 18 years old, he's from Waycross, Georgia, and he said, well, what do you mean, Mr. Dodd? And he said, if you touched a woman, you would know behind every curve on a woman's body, every softness on a woman's body, there's a muscle. And you have to study the muscle. And in some cases, that sculpture reminded me of that story, because whoever it was knew sort of the contours of the forehead and the cheekbones. Um, and so I particularly like that. Uh, the artist who's able to create a presence. Um, the kiss, the sculpture, uh, the other sculpture back there, I thought it was clever, and this is only my interpretation. It doesn't necessarily mean, need to be yours, but once an artist creates an image, the image becomes mine because I'm the one looking at it, just as it does yours. And I found a certain danger in, the, in this work because it's the earthly sort of attraction of these implements. And if you look at the implements and see how sharp they are, it's right there, right behind, uh, you'll see what I'm talking about. Am I reading too much into it? Probably, <laughs> probably. Uh, there is a plate here, it's right over there next to the ostrich egg. Uh, it's rather simple. I love this plate. I hope nobody's bought it. I, love it. <laughs> I really love this plate. If I can, I would intend to buy it. It's decorative, but it's just the right amount of decoration. It's a hummingbird in flight. It's a slightly built up image of a bird suspended in space. And the round plate supports that image, and it is perfectly proportional. It's just the right size for a hummingbird. It's proportioned well. Um, it's nicely drawn. This is somebody who knows how to draw in space, and um, it shows actually the power of draftsmanship in space. So, although it's one of the, uh, you might see it as one of the simpler works in the show, it's one that I really, really like. One of the most elegant objects in this exhibition is the leaf vase. It's a lovely shape, and it's so lovely and so good that the handles, I appreciate the fact that they're a little disproportionate, and they're almost clumsy. And that's perfect because it denies the almost preciousness of that vase. I love the darker glaze and the color. They both help. Uh, it's a really a lovely glaze. Uh, and the decoration of that work is thoughtful. It appears to be random, but I don't think it is. I think it's very thoughtful uh, and very mannered, in fact. Um, so again, that's a question of taste, but it's also a uh, taste perhaps based on experience, not just mine, but the experience, the good experience of that artist. Um, there's one uh, object in this exhibition that I don't really have the vocabulary to describe, 
And I wasn't here. Remember, I just took notes. I took the notes, I came, and then I left. So I didn't have the work in front of me, and that's non-entry. And because my memory, my memory when I was making these notes is sort of entirely visual of this collage. I didn't have words about it that I remembered. It was almost entirely visual. So I remember it as, and I hope that you will see this around the corner there, you, that you see it as, um, as a sort of essay, a visual essay, in creating a new shape or a new way uh, to my experience, at least at looking at composition and form. So I looked at it as, um, as creating sort of another reality uh, for me, a visual reality. I love the photograph parking lot landscape. The row of trees look like a nocturnal sentinel as far as I was concerned. I like the <coughs> format of the presentation. Love that tree. I want all of you to look at it. Look at it with me because sometimes, you know, we try to teach University of Georgia students visual education and they miss so much looking at it. I want all of you to look at it for a minute. Notice the detail of the grass in the foreground. Notice that in the middle of the image you have a horizontal line of trees and that barn. And then you have what in that photograph? You have a vertical element. And that vertical element is the tree, and the tree is binding the foreground, the midground, and that beautiful sky. And look what's happened with this artist who knew what he or she uh, was doing. Look at the nimbus, the oriole around the tree, such that the lighting effect is rather splendid. And I don't know if that's the same artist as this work, uh, but I think it is. And this is a, uh, uh, he or she has manipulated um, that color so that it's saturated. Um, and there again, you have sort of the, the violet sky, those roiling clouds, and it's reflected in the um, movement of the trees as well. Those, these for me are compelling, manipulated, but strong works. We get to the honorable mentions. Um, I love the saturated colors of uh, the photograph of the uh, color of my grandmother's house. Um, 3526, which is right, right here. Um, it's, uh, all of you know Charles Sheeler's work, American artist, a sort of a Sheeler-esque image of a locomotive, which is directly coming at you, but to the side, the directness. Um, in fact, makes speed into something anthropomorphic, it seems to me. No arsenic, the plate. Um, there may be no arsenic, but it certainly does resemble old lace um, <laughs> or a cobweb. Coca Pelle Life Dance. Um, I've been to the West. This is a nicely carved work of art. Uh, cigar store. Loved it because it's illustrative, but the solid geometry and that work is somebody who is looking at the shape of things. You have columnar cigars, an oval or circular sign, and then behind it, something you may miss, the rectangular bricks. And they're spaced asymmetrically, so look at it carefully. Here comes the sun. It's right there, isn't it? Right, right there. Um, love this work because it's so descriptive. Um, it's of a fine painting of sunbreak, and a sunbreak that's sort of curiously placed um, in the right, sort of the right corner. Um, Gertrude Maud, I don't know what I think about it, except that I really love that word, because it's like, I call it an avian colloquy. You know, these two birds, these two chickens, these two guineas, whatever they are, who are sitting there having this conversation. Um, I love the geometry and movement of scully, dark caladium, I love the fact that y'all call it caladium, uh, where I'm from, uh, aren't caladiums elephant ears, and uh, they look like an elephant ear, um, and so, I, um, and just an aside there, I didn't know it was Margaret, but I keep giving Margaret uh, <coughs> awards at various, <laughs> uh, various fairs. Sparta Mill, again, there it is, the intensity of the color of the clouds, the red belt trees and the brush strokes, it's an intense work. These have just been some random comments and observations, and if I didn't mention your work, it's only because I didn't have the time or I didn't make good notes. For example, I wish I could talk to you about a peculiar work in this exhibition, and it is the only one like it in this exhibition, and I would have given it an award, except it was almost too peculiar, so I thought that I would just mention it to you and make sure you see it. It is a print, a monotype of birds, and were I talking to all of you, the members of the Monroe Art Guild, I would say, why is that the only work in this exhibition? 
What's the problem with the paucity of print, of works on paper? Oh, and it's something that it seems that you're, maybe the artists here are not oh, study. Oh, you know, you should take my judgment and what I'm saying with a certain amount of a grain of salt. Um, my judgment should be used as encouragement, truly, because I want all of you to remember and to emulate the artist as described by George Bernard Shaw. The true artist will let his wife starve, his children go barefoot, and his mother drudge for his living at 70 years or old. <laughs> He'll do all of that sooner than work at anything but his or her art. <laughs>County. This is Kevin Little with the Chairman's Report. Happy New Year 2014. It's been a long time since I've been on TV for a while. I had several events I had to attend and, and couldn't get on TV and show you some things that was going on. Um, I want to talk to you just a little bit about Hard Labor Creek and the water system in the county and give you a little idea of what, what we have in store for the future and what's going on. Behind me is a, is a uh, water system uh, of Walton County, which as you see the Monroe area here, they, they provide water service to everything inside this area. Social Circle provides water service down here and Loganville up here. All the rest of the unincorporated county is responsible of the Walton County Water Authority and Water and Sewage Authority. And what we're doing is Hard Labor Creek is going to be built right here. I've been showing that to you a lot. And we have some main systems already in place to be able to pump the water once it's taken care of. Um, the water system, will, the, the orange, will be a big loop that we'll be building around the county to, to enhance the system to where it'll be able to go to the, get enough water pressure to the residents that are living out in the, in the unincorporated area. And then we already have the water main line that goes into Oconee and then we'll have another water line, water mine that'll bring uh, off of Appalachie River the raw water, which will be treated and then sent around the county. And so this is some of the future that we have. All the current blue and purple lines are water lines that we have in place. Some of them may have to be upgraded as time goes, but as you can see over here on the western side where the majority of our growth has been, we uh, have a lot of water units there, and then out in the Gratis area you have some, but as you get out into the Good Hope, Jones Woods, and uh, that area, you don't have a lot amount of water, water lines. And so, as uh, this is the most rural part of the county, and uh, we will have to, this will enhance it with the, with the trunk lines that we have there, and we'll be able to uh, get water around the whole county. That's one of the big goals, is to be able to have Water, I know we've had a very rainy 2013 and uh, 2014 may be dry, you know, and so it, having water is very important over through the years. People's wells have been drying up and they'd call and ask when we're going to get water. But we're closer than ever now with the Governor's Water Initiative and able to get that money to build Hard Lever Creek. And uh, we're in the process right now of figuring out the water lines, what we need to do first and get, get everything going like that. But. Uh, I'll be talking to you probably about every week or every other week here on, on Channel 16. If you have any questions, give me a call, 770-267-1301. But I'll be updating you on several of the major events that's going on in the county over the next few weeks. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Becky Chenhall, right on Educator with the University of Georgia, Walton County Extension Office. And I'm so glad to tell you about Radon Action Month. January is National Radon Action Month. And even though I tell you to test your home all year long and I promote radon testing, radon awareness, radon education every month of the year, January is when we emphasize it more than any other. The Environmental Protection Agency has designated January is the time and I'll tell you one of the reasons is when we have this cold weather we tend to have our homes closed up more than any other time and there is a chance that your radon would be even higher uh, during during January during some of this weather so anytime is a good time to test your home for radon 
but January is a great time. We try to have um, more program special emphasis on radon. I hope you'll hear about radon on the on the radio, on your television, and I hope you'll encourage your your friends to test their homes for radon if they have not. Uh, one of the things that we do is uh, we let children, students, enter the Radon Poster Contest and we promote that and we announce the winners in January. And I'm so pleased to share those with you. And I want to tell you that Walton County had two out of the three state winners. I'm not talking about county winners. The state winners. And these students are going to be recognized next week by Georgia Governor Nathan Deal at the Capitol when he signs a radon proclamation. This radon proclamation says that everybody in the state of Georgia needs to test their home. Um, the first place winner for the state of Georgia uh, is from Oconee County and his name is Hayden Guthrie and I want to show you his picture, uh, his poster. We're very proud of him. And I want to tell you about our second and third place winner. Our second place winner is Tyler Haymans. Tyler is a seventh grader He's from Monroe, Georgia, and he attends Georgia Cyber Academy. And Tyler's poster says, not all scary things go bump in the night. Have your home tested for radon. And I want to say congratulations, Tyler. We are so very proud of you. Then I want to tell you about our third place state winner and her name is India Gibson. India is a sixth grader and she's at youth middle school. She's from Covington, Georgia and her poster title is the National Radon Hotline. Uh, we are so proud of India and so proud of our students in Walton County, Tyler and India. Congratulations and we look forward to seeing you next week at the governor's office. Um, these students have worked hard to create radon awareness. Um, they've done that with their posters. They've let their parents and family and friends know about radon and with when we publicize and show these posters different places more and more people will learn about radon and will want to test their homes um, and i just want to tell you a little bit about radon um, it's a radioactive gas it comes from the soil and the rock walton county uh, is one of the higher counties in the state of georgia uh, for the potential for radon, we have a lot of granite rock here. Most of that granite is from Stone Mountain. And granite has uranium. Uranium decays into radium. Radium decays into radon. It's naturally occurring, but it can be deadly. Radon is the second leading cause of lung cancer. It's the first leading cause of lung cancer among non-smokers. You need to test your house if you, if you have not. It's easy to do. We have radon test kits here at the Walton County Extension Office and I'd like for you to come by and, and pick up a test kit if you have not tested. Test kits are only $8. That covers postage, that covers laboratory analysis, and the cost of your test. So it's a, it's a great deal and you mail the test kit in after you've tested. You get your results back in about a, in about a week. Um, EPA recommends that you take action if your test results should be four or higher. So four is kind of that magic cut off number. Um, and of course the lower your radon the better. I want to show you one other poster um, as I conclude today. And this is one of our national winners from several years ago. This was the first 
winner of the radon of the national radon poster contest and we still use this poster to publicize radon testing um, and it says don't take a chance on radon and that's what I want to end with uh, today with you don't take a chance on your family's health go ahead test for radon if you have not thank you so much have a great day and come see me at the Walton County Extension Office Here. I'm Emily Russell, Director of Marketing here at Clearview Regional Medical Center. Thank you so much for joining us with a little health tidbit for the week. As always, we are so blessed to have with us Dr. David Norman, General Surgeon here at Clearview, um, and with his practice, Clearview Surgical Specialist right here in Monroe. So Dr. Norman, I understand that hernias are something that happen in a lot of Americans. That is very true. Hernia is a very, it's actually very prevalent. Um, a hernia, what well, actually is a hernia, a hernia is is it is a um, it's a protrusion of, in, of either intestines or an organ internal organ mm -hmm. or maybe some fat that comes through a weak area in the abdo in the abdominal musculature um, okay so it's very very common and um, it, people are more prone to it when they have weak muscles or sometimes it can be either acquired or uh, congenital when mm -hmm. you're born with it mm -hmm. but these are very 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 common things and the thing about a hernia is um, it does get better on its own the only way to fix it is with an operation. Hmm, because I've heard of a lot of different people getting hernias, and from what I understand, you can get a hernia from a myriad of different things and circumstances. Like, can you get them from lifting something heavy? Well, you know what, that's sort of almost a, like a, it, it, lifting heavy does not actually cause a hernia, but okay. it, it can make it worse. Okay. So, uh, every hernia is, is probably either congenital, meaning you were born with it, or acquired over some period of time as a weak area. So when you lift something heavy, you may feel, a person may feel like a, a bulge, mm -hmm. or, or a, a tearing pain, or something like that, and where the hernia was actually there before, but this has just exacerbated it, made it worse. But okay. you're right, anything that increases intra-abdominal pressure, so people who lift heavy are more prone, People who have a chronic cough mm -hmm. are more prone. People who have um, and maybe constipation, they're constantly pushing okay. that way. Anything that increases intra-abdominal pressure will make a person more prone to, to have... Now, is a hernia always in the abdominal area? Well, actually, it, it, it's, it's the covering of the abdomen. So okay. anywhere it can be, it's not always on the front of the abdomen but it, is, it has to do with the abdominal uh, compartment. So okay. you can actually have a hernia up here at the top of your okay. abdominal compartment, which is a, called a, a hiatal hernia, where a part of the stomach actually herniates or goes up into the chest. Mm -hmm. you can, people can get herniations in the back area here, still coming from the abdominal wall, mm -hmm. air, the mm -hmm. abdominal wall, but they go through the back. But most of them are on the, on the front part of the abdominal wall and in the inguinal or groin regions. So they can come from right. So men are a little bit more pr prone to inguinal groin hernias because of our anatomy. Um, where the testicles descend, that little area is called the inguinal canal, and that can be a little weak area yeah. over mm -hmm. time. And so, if someone's a dock worker, or they just, for whatever reason, lift heavy or do, do things, the stressors of life, um, then that area can push through. Or if you've had a prior operation where mm -hmm. surgery is, mm -hmm. where anytime you have an operation on your abdominal wall, if it gets stitched up and it heals, that mm -hmm. area is very strong, but it's never quite as strong as the rest of the abdomen. So okay. it becomes a weak area. And so, so, a hernia is basically a bulge. It Something is that is bulging where it's not supposed to be. Correct. That is right. <laughs> okay, so how do you fix it? What, as a general surgeon, how do you fix a hernia? Well, there's several ways to fix hernias, and, and the, 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 your hernia fix will depend on the type of hernia. We mm -hmm. talked about there's many types. There's inguinal or groin hernias, abdominal or hernias, umbilical hernias around where the belly button is, prior surgical hernias, they call those incisional hernias, um, or hiatal hernias. So depending on the type of the hernia you have, the size of the hernia, and then other comorbidities like your body size and things like that, and other, you know, but but that's how you'll you'll decide between the doctor and the patient. Um, but the hernias generally can be fixed in several ways. One is a primary repair, which means just stitching it up. I like to think of a hernia okay. like a buttonhole. If you have right. on a shirt and it's got a hole where mm -hmm. your button goes mm -hmm. through, that's a buttonhole. And so if that was your musculature something can poke through there. Mm -hmm. And so a primary repair just means putting a stitch right there. That's okay. all it is. And then after that, there's what's called a mesh repair. You can put mesh on, onlay mesh. You put the mesh down there, which is a man-made material, like a little patch, and stitch it around. That's another way. Mm. And the way I usually fix hernias, depending on the type, is a laparoscopic repair. Okay. Which is another minimally invasive type mm -hmm. of procedure. Mm -hmm. But we usually go in through the sides, 
and go behind underneath the hole and put the patch okay. below it, kind of like patching a tire that way. Oh, okay, very good. And what's, what's the recovery time? Is this an inpatient procedure, outpatient? How long does it take to recover? That's a good question. Uh, my rule of thumb for folks is about two weeks. Okay. It's about two weeks. Um, doesn't have to mean you're bedridden or homebound, but it takes you about two weeks to get back to where you kind of were pre mm -hmm. you know, before mm -hmm. surgery. Again, depending on the type of the hernia and the size of it, all those mm -hmm. different factors and your level of activity. About two weeks, I usually tell people or students, tell them about two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, bosses tell them about two weeks but some people go back earlier and some later so that's just a, a general rule of thumb you know but um, dep also depends on um, the, the type of work a person does and mm -hmm. what type of activity mm -hmm. they're going back to the right, best job right. goes back sooner than someone who has to do a lot Just of lifting yeah. heavy things and is it usually an outpatient procedure they come in and out in the same day mm -hmm. So, By and large. So usually patients. not having a hospital stay to repair a hernia. Usually not. Of okay. course, there can be, you know, there are other circumstances. Right, can right. Be. Usually a hernia repair is in and out same day. Very good, yeah. very good. Now, how would somebody know if they were suffering from a hernia? Good question, another good question. Um, so we talked about a bulge. You mm -hmm. can feel a soft bulge. Uh, often if it's in the groin, it may feel like a little round ball or a little round bulge there. It sometimes can be painful. Okay. If you notice it in the prior scar or around mm -hmm. the belly button mm -hmm. or the groin region, those are all symptoms. It can hurt a little bit. Usually when someone bends over or they lift something heavy or if they cough or laugh or sneeze, it can hurt there. The other thing, we talked about a little bit about the hiatal hernia. The symptoms for that usually have a lot to do with reflux type symptoms. That would be a good topic for us to talk about another time. That would be good. Yeah, so generally heartburn would be yeah. would be a sign of a hiatal hernia. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. very good. People very can good. get other things too, like these extra esophageal reflux type symptoms. Uh -huh. They get chronic co coughing or chronic uh, um, clearing of the throat, mm -hmm. cough, vocal changes, hoarseness. All of that can be also a sign of a hiatal hernia. Oh, so if you've got any of these symptoms going on, maybe some tightness or you're feeling a bulge or maybe you've got some of these esophageal mm -hmm. symptoms, what would be the best thing to do? Do they need to see their primary care or can they directly refer to a surgeon or well, what's I, the best way? I think anyone that comes to see me with that, I'll for sure take care of it, but I think primary doctors are always a good starting point. Mm -hmm. They're the gatekeepers and there's command central right there. They're always a good starting point and they can send you out to see someone like me or just if you got that kind of problem, just come and see me. That's no problem. We'll take care of it. Great, sure great. And your office is right here in Monroe. That's right. It's next to the old hospital on Breedlove Drive. That's right. Um, That's right. Your suite number is... 200? I think it is. I think it's 200. <laughs> and your phone number is 770-267-1892. 1892. And right. they can also check you out online. Yes, ma'am. Clearviewsurgical.com. Yes, ma'am, they may. Fantastic. Yes. So there's lots of ways to get in touch with Dr. Norman. Um, and I assume that you probably make this a really easy process for patients. I try to As do far that, as yes. talking about it. We try to go over everything. And the other thing I want to just mention real quickly about hernias is that um, this is important, that a hernia can also be a... Um, it, it, it can be a sign of other medical issues. Oh. So people should not, if you have a hernia, do not just ignore it uh, because a couple things can happen. One can be something called strangulation, mm -hmm. where the, the mm -hmm. intestinal process, the intestinal uh, part that goes out gets strangulated or cut off from its blood supply. That can be an emergency. And the other thing is a hernia can be, it can sort of be a sign of other problems like chronic lung issues, people who may have a colon problem or a prostate problem, any kind of things like that are very important that we need to take care of. Um, so hernias shouldn't just be, you know, not let, left alone and not, not seen about. So if you're concerned, definitely call your doctor. Right. Definitely call Go your and see your doctor. It never hurts to ask. It never, never hurts, hurts to, to have ask. it checked out. Never hurts to ask. Never hurts to um. check. So we do, we do try to make it easy. Uh, talk about it. We talk about the symptoms, what, you know, and some people are able to, some hernias don't need to be fixed. Mm -hmm. Some do not. All don't have to be fixed, depending on, again, the size and the amount of symptoms that, that you may be having. Sometimes they can be reducible. People may have a hernia that goes back in or goes away when they lay down. And uh, some folks can delay surgery for months or even years, and mm -hmm. some may not even have to, need to have surgery. But one of the things is we, we, we need to look at all of the, everything around it so that we'll know that if we need to check for some of these other problems, mm -hmm. chronic mm -hmm. lung issues um, or colon or prostate problem, or depending on the size and the extent of the hernia, need to recommend surgical correction. Very good, very good. Well, I know that if I were suffering from a hernia, I would definitely call Dr. Norman. Do that, yes. <laughs>
<laughs> you you made a, a great example of talking about the buttonhole, and that, and that definitely makes sense. You know, I hear a lot about hernias, different people suffering from hernias, but I didn't exactly know what that what is, meant, what or that there were so many different types of hernias as well. So um, very informative. Thank, thank you so much as always, Dr. Norman. Thank you for joining well, I us. You taking time to speak. With me. Most definitely. So if you have any further questions for Dr. Norman, or you may have some concerns or some problems area areas going on with you and your health, feel free to give him a call over at Clearview Surgical Specialist. He'll be happy to get you in and, and get you seen and, and take care of you. So as always, thank you for joining us. And if there's ever anything that we can do here at Clearview Regional Medical Center to meet your needs, we are happy to do so. Thanks again, and thanks again, Dr. Norman. Thank you, Emily. On Stage presents A Bad Year for Tomatoes, February the 14th, 15th, 21st, and 22nd at 8 p.m. And then they have two other showings, February the 28th and March the 1st at 8 p.m. You can find tickets on sale at Carmichael's here in Monroe. Hey, thanks for tuning in today. As usual, we're going to show you some of the dogs and cats that are here at Walton County Animal Control. You know, we really like the winter time because it gives us a little bit of a slowdown and amazingly the shelter isn't full of cats right now. But you know, spring and summer are right around the corner and we start getting in just tons and tons of cats and puppies. So we really need your help to get your pet spayed and neutered. Maybe there's some cats that have been hanging around your house. You don't mind them being there, but you know what? It'd be a good idea to get them spayed or neutered. That way you don't have to bring in uh, litters of kittens to us in the spring. And we want to tell you about uh, a deal that's going on right now. It's for Walton County residents. They're doing $25 spays for cats. So you can get your cat spayed for only $25. This is through Pound Puppies and Kittens Rescue, and you can call them at 770-972-5067, or look on their website, which is ppnk.org. And so help us out. Maybe you've got that cat, you've been wanting to do it, well, now there's no excuse. Only $25 to get that cat spayed. You know, but like I said, we enjoy this slow time where not as many animals are coming in, but every springtime, it just breaks loose again. So help us out, do the responsible thing as a pet owner and get them fixed. Uh, maybe in this new year you wanna get a new pet for your house. We're gonna show you now some of the dogs that are here at the shelter. Just come on down and have a visit. This is a beagle, probably about a couple, few years old. Looking for a good home. <laughs> this is Charlene, she is a pit. Um, she's about two years old. She's already spayed. She's microchipped. She's very sweet. Needs a good home. This is a two-year-old long hair female cat. Her name is Kenzie. Um, she's very, very sweet. Loves to sit in your lap and purr. Um, she needs a good home. We have us here a little black with tan Dotson mix. And he'll even stand up. I say that and he ain't gonna do it. Come here, boy. Alright. He does it, uh, whenever he's not on screen. This is Bentley. He's current on his shots. He's neutered. Looking for a good home. About two years old. This is Colin. He's two years old. He's not neutered. He's a long hair. And he needs a good home also. Hello, my name is Anita Peters with Peters Realty Professionals in Loganville, Georgia. And I have some beautiful homes to share with you today. Information deemed reliable but not guaranteed. Some of the featured homes are HUD properties and any registered HUD agent can show and sell you a HUD home. Thanks so much for watching. We want to thank our sponsors, Creative Artist Video Production, for all of your video needs. Snellville Heating and Air, serving Monroe and Walton County since 1988 for all of your heating and cooling needs. And Creative Signs. No sign is too large or too small for Creative Signs. What we do to the planet, we do to ourselves.
You can help keep America beautiful. Visit kab.org. On stage presents A Bad Year for Tomatoes. We're the 14th, 15th, 21st, and 22nd at 8 p.m. And then they have two other showings, February 28th and March the 1st at 8 p.m. You can find tickets on sale at Carmichael's here in Monroe.